this lecture uh, from interaural scanner to digital implant model. The implant model has been something that earlier on we struggled with. You know, we were always looking for the proper uh, analog. And the analog beside me, this is the PMA analog. And when I was in, in Germany uh, in 2018 at the ExoCAD uh, summit you know i i went to the elos presentation and they were they were launching this analog and i was taking pictures and sending it to my brother eric saying eric i think i found it i'm gonna let casper and uh and ralph go through the analog and and why it why it's such a great product elos covers all these products we the the elos catalog is a lot a lot more information but i what i wanted to do is just say that for all these implants companies on the on the facing left side, they cover that. And then for Dense Plicerona, we have all components along with Noble BioCare, Stroman, and Zimmer. And all the prosthetic screws are, are designed for every implant system and the Hexobler screws of what it's available also. And I'll have to say the ELOS people and the amount of effort they go in for and the details they go through. It's just like, you know, they're explaining me all these details and I just look at them and I go, you know, who else does this? Because it's a, it's incredible. Right here, we have all the scan bodies and with the scan bodies, uh, this is, you know, the EOS analog has to be accurate and obviously the scan body has to be accurate. For scanning any of the labs that are, are participating in this course, we know that we get scans like of, of scan bodies in from the doctors and anyone with the large hole that you can see on photos, the ones with the larger holes we see when we get scans, sometimes they just roll and they almost kind of melt into each other. We don't get as much accuracy. Whereas the ELOS, which is in the middle, we have the um, smaller diameter holes. And also the ELOS with the, a few of those other ones have that metal interface. And that's a machine metal measured to the implant. Whereas some of the ones that are we're showing here have, just have peak interface. This is the ELO scan body is a reusable product. Sterilization guide, if you, if you would like that sterilization guide, by all means, we can provide that for you. And then we got all the, all the products here. And to, to order stuff, we have shop. And then you just go down to Elos Analogs, and we have all the all the products there. So what we've done is we've tried to organize this. So if you order a Strawman, uh, we'll go bone level, and then we have the Elos Analog for print. We have that up above, and then down below we've parented it with all the other products. If you go to hybrid bases and, and order like a hybrid base, and then it, and when you order the hybrid base, it asks you what type of prosthetic screw, a straight one, and the, or a hexobler, which is the angulation. And then you just add those to cart. And then it'll also ask you for what, if you need a driver, it'll ask you if you need a driver. If you don't need a driver, that's not a problem. And then you add these to cart and it's checkout all very fast and it's through um, Shopify. So it, everything, it works out quite well. And you just, it's very secure and everything else. Ralph, um, he, he's uh, Elos Medet Tech Master Technician and Senior Manager for Technical Support and Sales in Germany. He's a Master Technician. He has been working, he's been working in the dental field for many years. He, he's an excellent form of knowledge from a dental laboratory's perspective so it's fabulous to have have him uh, as part of their team and casper casper is one of the most knowledgeable people in done a lot of work and lots of research and continues to do research great let's get started in the center of everything it's the open workflow what we are discussing today yeah but more specifically, we are discussing about the pma today so open workflow connecting with our pma means to enable our customers to use our products in an open CAD CAM environment, not just in a limited special constellation of hard and software environment. So I think that's the idea of an open workflow. And uh, as we stated, one part of this is the PMA as a product mm -hmm. we use in this open workflow. Perfect. Let's, let's have a look at the agenda. So. Uh, we have the, the ELOS aircraft analog for printed models. Uh, this is the agenda that we're going to talk about. Uh, so I think we have a really good good topic here at hand. We're going to start a little about uh, what is a PMA. Or yes, I think model. that's the, 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 the basic point 
what is a PMA? Yes, so mm -hmm. the first point is to go into the actual use of this PMA, which is the printed model analog. So it's yes. a analog, a physical part to transfer the implant position from the intraoral scan to a digital model, which you can print later. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and then we have a little bit about the plasma model versus the dependent model because I guess you can't really compare these two. I think that's what we're going to cover here. Uh, and then we have a little bit about the the history because this is actually not the first analog of uh, PMA that we had. We actually had a, a previous version as well, and we're just going to touch base a little bit about what actually happened, and that's a little bit to do with the technology. Yeah, uh, and then some some development uh, on how we actually develop the actual uh, physical product and the history behind that. And then the more technical part of it, how does it actually work? Yes, sure. It's, it's just about installing mm. the PMA in the model, yes, uh, to show if we need any auxiliary parts or tools for installing it, yes. And the last section is for sure, as the last webinar, the tips and tricks section, yeah, yeah. which means exactly. we want to show you how to create your own settings or to modify your settings right in the CAD software to enable you to print a very accurate model in your uh, 3D printing process. Perfect. I know you got a lot of interesting stuff for us. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And as Ralph mentioned, this is actually our second webinar. Uh, if you haven't seen the first one, this was on libraries. Uh, make sure to, to look it up and, and have a look at it. Uh, we encourage you to do so. But uh, let's get started. Yeah. So I think, oh, as you mentioned, or we, we did a first webinar about the libraries, and this also starts a little bit with the library. Mm. Uh, maybe you remember if you participate the, the last webinar. Oh, yeah. So this is a picture of the actual uh, placeholder, scan body, everything in the library. Right. That's sure. all yeah. these digital parts which are implemented in the library, but one specific file here is the placeholder file, which is shown here on the left in blue, yes, and it's an integral and important part of our library because it generates the, the, the hole in the model, the insertion slot for the physical implant analog. Yeah, yeah. So, so as you see on, on the model rotating a little bit in the corner there, so the actually the cavity inside the model where the analog fits. And I think we talked about that in the last webinar, that is, is the, the analog itself is actually not important. Well, what's important here is actually the placeholder file yeah. with the, the light blue one that you said. Okay, I think you have a, a nicer picture here. Is is that what we're talking about? Yes, right. You see, this is just the physical part, uh, which is green here in this picture, and it's enclosed by the placeholder file like a shell. Yeah. yeah. So it's specific adapted to the ge outer geometry of the analog. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So is is the is the placeholder file that kind of mixes the the, the scan file together with the uh, with the cavity for the for the analog. So it's kind of like a merge between the, the digital scan file and the uh, and the actual cavity for the for the analog. Yeah, and it's precisely aligned to the scan body, yeah. which is always the starting point of the intraoral scan. Exactly. Yeah. So it's not just the geometry of the placeholder; it's also the adjustment to the scan body part in the library. Okay, and I think you have a, a close-up picture of the actual placeholder file. So this is like a, a cross-section. So now we see what actually goes in uh, inside the placeholder file. So this is actually quite detailed uh, cavity or, or placeholder we have here. Yes, and, and you see maybe on this picture that it not just enclose the analog like a negative shape, of yeah. the outer geometry. No, you have offsets around mm -hmm. the analog, but you have specific small areas in this place of the file which are colored here in, in green color. Yes. And you see it's, it's not a large contact area between the place of the file and the analog. It's it's focused more on small, well-defined areas, which mm -hmm. is much easier to control in your process. Oh yeah. Absolutely. So this is actually the, the PMA is itself, this is how it looks from the library side, this is how the, it works together with the model builder, model creator software and merges the actual design yeah. together with your, your 3D printed model in, in the end. Right, it just generates the hole in the model Perfect. to make yeah. it easy. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay, great. So the next bit here I'm a little intrigued about because, so I'm not a Dental technician, so I need to draw a little on your expertise here. But 
plasma model and a printer model. Are they the same? As you might be thinking that the 3D model or the printed model is just a digital twin yeah. of the plasma model, but it isn't. Yes, because today still a big amount of models are made on the conventional process. And that's the plasma model. That's the plasma model. Yeah. And I think it's still, especially for implant model, it's still the benchmark in precision. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even you have a multi-step process chain with a contraction of impression material, with expansion of plaster, with maybe limited access of the tray to the patient's mouth with all this uh, blood and uh, uh, saliva. saliva around, oh. yeah. So on the other hand, we have in many cases more convenient options for digital impressions and model production today with new materials, with different 3D printers, with different settings and so on. So I think the 3D model printing is still an involving technique in the field of implant prosthetics. And according to the current state of the art, the intended use of conventional plaster models and D printed models can be viewed differently. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're saying is you cannot really replace the, the traditional plaster model one to one with the 3D printed model. No, not not really. Not today, maybe. Yeah. So um, I think it's fast developing when we're looking in the back 10 years mm. when we look at 3D printing. It's a fast and a very good development in 3D printing. But today I would always say it doesn't replace the plaster model one-to-one. -one. It's not a digital twin. Okay. And I think you actually make some, uh, some studies on this, you can say. So you actually put in a lot of legwork in this. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yes, this is called a felt color comparison. So that means <clears throat> when you create the model in your CAD software, you get an SDL file. Yeah. And this SDL file is processed in the CAM software of the 3D printer. And right? it's actually nominal. So this is like <clears throat> the, the perfect this yes. is what you designed. This is the perfect yeah. model, the perfect base. So this is what you want to have at the end when you print your model. model. Yeah. And that's what I did here. I printed the model from this file with mm -hmm. different uh, 3D printers, different materials, and then I, I, I um, scanned the printed model yeah. as a high-resolution industrial scanner and superimposed both SDL oh, files okay. together. And then you see clearly the deviations. Okay, yes. so, so we have three different pictures here. So what's the difference between each picture? Is it different uh, printers or...? Yeah, I think it's easy to understand. Everything which is green is fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that means zero yeah. micron uh, deviation. Yeah. So you see, the more colorful, the, the worse, <laughs> so oh. to speak. Okay. Yeah. So um, you see, these are all 3D printers. Some of them are SLA based with laser lights. Some of them, uh, one is DLP printed. And you see that you have, depending on the size of your jaw, you get more and more deviations, yeah. Oh, uh, especially in the molar region, you see that you get higher deviations. And that's maybe the idea behind to show you that is to see that you never get exactly the SDL file oh. produced like it was from the CAD software. So it's always a little bit different depending on your specific setup in your lab. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so so what we're talking about is actually, well, if you don't have a plaster model uh, and you get an intraoral scan and you do a restoration like a bridge yeah. and you want to bond it, what you're saying is that you shouldn't bond on the 3D printed model because what we're seeing here is there can be some, some inaccuracy in the 3D printing, uh, but what should you then do if you don't have this plaster model to, to actually bond on? Yeah, so I think, as we just said, so it's depending on, on a lot of different factors. Like okay. we have here, yeah. Yeah, so um, for multi implant construction, I would prefer always either direct intraoral bonding, which might be yeah, not, not easy, not for, for each case the best way, because everything is wet, you have to dry it. Yeah, uh, but you actually get like the, the full passive fit because that's the 
Yes, you get a full passive yeah. fit. So theoretically, it's the best yeah. uh, process to do so. Yeah, but on the other side, I would say I would prefer the so-called in bridge bonding. Mm, that yeah. means um, that means that the milled bridge ensures always better precision as the printed model. Ah, so due to the manufacturing of the milling machine is. Uh, more yes. accurate and stable yes. than you feel in the result of you saw on your, your previous slide. Right. So you are using the bridge like some kind of jig. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and uh, then you can bond your hybrid bases in the bridge. Yes. Mm -hmm. Without any model. Yes. But for sure, that means that your bridge has to be precisely manufactured and that the titanium basis has some kind of self-guiding or self-centering mm. functionality exactly yeah and here on the, on the picture we have the the hybrid base uh, the non-engaging from from us and i think we can cover that in a, in a later webinar but here we're actually talking about features that actually facilitate this yes and we see we maybe just shortly go through this hybrid base so you see these two antennas yeah our guide tips yeah yes and this means also that you have a self-centering functionality. Yeah. So in this case, I always would prefer the in-bridge bonding instead of bonding on the a printed 3D model. Yeah. It's it's okay for single use, I think, yeah. for single implant restoration, but multi-implant restoration, I think I would prefer the in-bridge bonding always. Okay. That's really good. So so next up here, we actually have a little history lesson. Because the the PMA is actually not the first analog from from okay. either side. No, we we actually started uh, all the way back in in 2013 2014 with the MA. As you can see on the screen, we have the Elos Accurate model analog. This is what we refer to as the the MA version, and then we have the Elos Accurate uh, analog for print model, which is in short what we call the PMA or print model analog. And the history is actually that we started. When, when all this actually were a very emerging technology and very new, uh, we started with the MA version. And if you look at the design of these two, they're, they're quite different. You can say that yeah. uh, the MA is very, it's more, more or less like cylinder. It has a small notch uh, for rotation and lock. And then in the top, it have these small bumps that actually give a, 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 like a, a click feature so you can click it into yeah, the, yeah. To the model. Right. Uh, and if you look at the PMA, it's way different. Uh, it's more detailed. Uh, there's a lot of details on it. It's more complicated to manufacture. But what it in theory means is that whereas the MA was a, a simple cylinder, the cavity that we needed to print had to be very exact, exact yeah. for it to actually fit. Whereas with the PMA, we kind of reversed it. So the, the cavity in, in the PMA, even though it looks very difficult uh, and uh, uh, and so on, it's actually it's suitable for the printers to print. Uh, and they actually gave the, the the PMA the ability to to have the cavity or the play filter as we talk so much about uh, to have a little more uh, absorbance of tolerances. Right, right. And um, maybe you remember, and uh, I remember as well as a dental technician that at the beginning you don't have the possibilities to for in-house printing yeah, as you send yes. it to big service centers, yeah. and they are worked with. With, with industrial 3D printers, which exactly. were very expensive, but it's easy to control the process yeah. because you just have sure. three or four resources to print yeah. worldwide. It was a more yeah. maybe in the beginning of this emerging technology, it was more uh, accurate than what we saw for the first years because you had like a bigger industrial machines, more yeah. control, and all that. And they actually, looking back at it, so so here we actually have. The installation part of the MA. So the idea was that you have this kind of like audible click feature. So it will just snap into the, the model once it was printed. And this print uh, that we see in the video was exactly made, as you said, from this big print center. Yeah. Uh, that at the time actually gave a really good good uh, result. Yeah. Um, and the material was 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 hard. Uh, so you could have this like audible feedback when you click it in. Um, what I normally say is well. Things kind of change when all these more affordable desktop resin 3D printers came on the market. Right, right. So it's always the same. I think when the process improves, you ha also have to improve the product and yeah. to adjust it to the new exactly. improved process. Yeah. That's what we did here. Yeah, we, we saw a shift in technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ended up in a situation where you could argue, well, the, the MA was not actually up 
or fit for the actual technology enhancement that we saw at the moment, which is why we uh, decided uh, in 2018 to actually design the, uh, the the PMA instead, actually taking into consideration all this new emerging technology that we had. So here it actually is. Yeah. Uh, here we see the uh, the PMA uh, with all the details and all that, and we're gonna gonna cover all the features and the installation part, part a little later. Uh, but what I would like to touch a little bit upon uh, on here is actually the, the tool set. Um, because we have this tool set, uh, I'm going to go more in depth with that. Um, but that might be a little uh, different from other uh, providers. Uh, we have a quite uh, quite nice tool set here. And there's a little funny history to that, which I actually <laughs> thought I would share. Uh, because uh, the way it actually happened, uh, which is a little funny, but... But uh, so the, the head of development here in Denmark, he was actually uh, very fond of going uh, mountain biking. Uh, and as we, <laughs> not to, so, so this is uh, not not actual footage, let me say that, but uh, this happens in more than one occasion. Uh, and during the development phase of the PMA back in, in 2018, he actually broke his hand and you can actually see his uh, the X-ray on on, yeah, on, yeah. on the screen, um, and and the, the funny part of this was that even though that he had broke some fingers uh, in, in his right hand, he was actually uh, able to install the first prototypes of the PMA in a printed model using this tool. Okay, and I find <laughs> find that funny because it just goes to show that even though that actually you you can have a really nice and tight fit between the the model and the PMA. It requires very little effort to actually install it, and the good thing about this tool is that it actually pulls the, uh, the PMA into the right position in the right angle with very little effort. Yes, that's a nice story because um, for sure you can develop a nice product, a very precise product, but mm -hmm. the process behind how to install it yeah. is also important. Yes, and so it makes absolutely sense to have a tool for it and. Maybe you can compare it also with other processes in the lab. You always need tools to mm, yeah. finalize your product at the end. Yeah, yeah. that's how it is. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's like when you're doing like home repairment, uh, working at home, or replacing whatever. If you don't have the right tools, yeah, and it, you, it takes like twice yeah. the amount of time. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the reason why. I think it's a one-time invest just at the beginning. Yeah, so you can use it for. Yeah, sure. many years. Yeah, for sure. It will not get worn. And, and one of the first questions that we actually got when we actually uh, introduced this, especially the plier tool that has this O-ring, uh, the, the function as a spring uh, or elastic band, that, that people were concerned that it was actually going to uh, gonna break because it would get fragile or for UV light and, and, and so on. But it's actually, I don't really remember the specific, uh, specific name for it, but it's like the like this aerospace great O-ring, so it will actually last a lifetime. And for now, <laughs> it surely have. But let's uh, let's move on to the actual installation phase, because here we see uh, the PMA with the features, and we also see a picture of the uh, of the cavity or the placeholder as we talked about before. And I think what's important to mention here is that on top, if you look at that, we have our cutting wedges. So we have yeah. these four cutting wedges in the top that actually stabilizes uh, the the PMA inside the cavity or the placeholder, uh, but it also cuts into the model. So the big difference here between this PMA and, and maybe especially the MA, uh, as I talked about, but also maybe also other uh, similar product is that this analog or this PMA is designed to actually cut into the model. So we're actually making all these areas that we highlighted in the in the placeholder file uh, or the cavity is actually where we have excess material, yeah. meaning that we're actually printing a geometry where there is uh, excess material for the analog to cut into. And while it can cut into the to the model, it can also seat very, uh, very nice and tight uh, every time. So you're not as depending on the variation that might be yes, in what right. we're 3D printing. Yeah. Right. Uh, and then we have three large locking areas in the bottom, meaning that it's really rotational safe. Uh, you can really target once you install it into the model. It will not, not rotate, it will not turn, it will not snap. And then in the bottom of these three cutting edges, we are, uh, locking areas, we also have cutting edges. So it actually also cuts in the bottom of the cavity, uh, as we see uh, in, in the picture here. And of course, we have the tool set for it. And we're going to go through the installation process. Right. And it's color-coded. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is maybe important uh, if you have a box full of uh, PMAs. Yeah, yeah. You sure. see, oh, this is referring to this platform or to the other platform. So it's following the anodization of the of the original yeah. uh, providers, right? Exactly, exactly. So. Again, this is a small preview. So here we actually see the features compared to the placeholder file we showed earlier and, and where you clearly can see these highlight area and where it will cut. Yeah. So um, I think we should have a look on the installation process yeah. because uh, it comes here. We have this, uh, it's kind of like an instructional video that shows very well how to install the, the PMA. So we, we have it here. Uh, as you mentioned, it will. we made it for especially for 3D printing. Uh, it is very much suitable for it. We have the color coding, as you mentioned. Uh, it follows the color coding of the implant manufacturer as uh, our scan bodies and so forth. Mm -hmm. We have all the nice features here. We have the cutting wedges on top. We have, of course, the, uh, the implant connection uh, with all the different platforms we support. We have the locking area here on the bottom. You can really see this is a, a strong locking area, so it will really keep in the place. It will not rotate during work. Uh, and we have the thread here on the bottom that actually fits to the, uh, to the installation tool. So what actually, the best way to do it is to, to have your insertion pin uh, and to mount that on the backside of the model uh, and just place the, uh, the, uh, the analog on it and then pull it into position. So it's a one yeah, position only. Pull it down until it stops. Yeah. Right. And once you get into position and you pull it down and you cannot pull it any further, it actually is a point where it starts cutting. Yeah. And this is where you need the, uh, the pliers tool. So the idea here is that you slide the tool in over and then turn it. And then you can just by applying a little bit of pressure, you're pulling the analog, but you're pulling it in the right direction. Yeah. So it's very easy. It's very easy to install it. And you can very easily feel when it buttons out in, in the bottom of the, of the print and it's seated. Uh, and here we can, again, we see the, the wedges that actually cut into the model. And it's very easy to handle. We also have what we call an insertion screw. I always say that this is optional. It's only if you want to use it. We have the thread in the analog. We can use it if you like to. We have a small magnet on the end of the plier, so it just like snaps into it. Uh, and you can use it to make sure that you have your, your analog in place. If you are in little doubt of, about the, the fit of it, you can use it. Um, but I always, always say that well, it's optional. Yeah. So it's like having belt and braces together. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and this uh, instructional guide uh, it also comes as a, like a one pager where you just have all the steps. I've seen many technicians actually use this for the first time, uh, and in, in my experience, it's only takes like two or three tries, and and then you yeah. get a hang. And also, you can print it out, uh, put it on your yeah. working place, yeah, so you can see it uh, in your exactly. daily work. Yeah, so it makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, it's available on, on lustental.com uh, uh, for download. What we also did back in 2018 is, well, with having the, the MA in mind and this new emerging technology with desktop printers uh, coming out, we thought, well, during the development uh, of the PMA, we actually took and sent prototypes of it to many of the large uh, 3D print manufacturers. Mm -hmm. uh, and they did uh, a print test. They printed it on their setup uh, to figure out what's the best settings uh, in terms of layer thickness towards the different materials that they have. Um, but also the post curing, uh, the washing, yeah. and all these also important steps that we might not really consider when we started all this uh, yes. with this new technology. That is not only the printing; it's also how do you handle the printer? Yes, and you remember maybe the white vest just at the beginning yeah, of yeah. the printing, yes, because the post processing uh, process was not really defined. In the no. lab. Yes. So uh, this comes warmer. Now you have more automatically washing stations, curing sure, stations, yeah, yeah. and all this. And people are often very focused on the hardware side. So what is the layer size and the resolution and all that? But there's much more. You have different light sources, different light exposure, mm -hmm. different light uh, in, in in intensity. Oh, yeah. Yes, or different movement, uh, speed of the platform, different viscosity of the material. So a lot of influence factors running around this redeeming process. That's why we need always to test on the, the single setup. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. having a general uh, fitting or 
It's exactly. And right? there's a lot of things. One of the things that also strikes me when I'm talking about visiting labs is also, well, it's all about the the daily work. It's, it's the maintenance, it's the environment of the printer. Yeah, there's a lot, of, there yeah. a lot of factors playing into this. Uh, and, and we did this uh, this test and we did it also not only back in 2018 during the development phase, but we also did it throughout uh, throughout time where we, we, we try to do it with new printers coming into the market. And the setup is the same. So we, we send parts to the manufacturer. They do a test run. Uh, they figure out, well, what's their best settings? And then we have these printing guides, which also is available on LinkedIn.com. But basically, it just gives an, 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 an overview on, well, what's the curing uh, method? What's the cleaning methods recommended? What kind of materials do they recommend? And the layer thickness, uh, and then we actually together with the manufacturer we come up with the a recommended analog to model offsets, which I know you have a lot on that on our tips and tricks. For the yeah, later. sure, sure. Uh, so I think it's a good starting point to have something like that. So it's, it's a results on your test here, yeah. um, but um, anyway, you have a very specific setup always uh, mm -hmm. in your lab, and therefore. We we came to the or we'll come to the tips and tricks section, yeah, yeah, where you can see how you can modify your settings or influence uh, uh, directly in the CAD software the tolerances of your placeholder file mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, but uh, what do you have for us for the tips and tricks? Yes, um, this is about how to influence the offset, and uh, if you see here an Exocad a model creator. You see here in this window, you see there's a section which is called settings. And you see that you can modify the offset around the mm. physical analog. Yeah. Yeah? So zero means you have zero micron offset. So it, it. it's exactly as it is in the library. Basically. Exactly as it's in the library, yeah. yes. And when you generate your model, then the placeholder file is exactly like in the library, mm. yes. But as we mentioned, we have always shrinkage in the materials, yeah. everything like that. So it enables you in the software also to um, modify the offset. Yeah. Okay, so you can actually control it. And, and this is, yeah. goes back to the to the accuracy and the tolerances of the printer. Yes. And you see it here oh, with yeah. zero micron. You see that the cutting actions go yeah. the nice overlap here. even the material. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, to, to make the retention between the, the analog and the model, but you can also modify it here and let's say going up to 50 micron, yeah. yes, and run the model again. You see, now take some seconds. Yeah, so make it transparent and zoom in. And then you see that the cutting actions oh, are yeah, not so moves. much deep in the model than before. Okay. So that's an, a nice way to to set up your own offset depending on your process yeah. yeah okay real nice it's a real nice feature yeah you know you see yeah. this is the, the the hole in the model and now yeah. you see how that like the the, the cavity of the placeholder file kind right. of merges with the with the rest of the more right. anatomical part right. of the yeah. of the model that's great that's okay. good to know so so that was the exocad here we have a tree shape Yes, we have an, in 3Shap it's a little bit different because in 3 in our library, if you import our library, mm -hmm. then there comes automatically a, let's say, material file inside, yeah. which includes a specific offset. And we predefined it as 20 micron. Yeah, yeah as so a if starting you, point. As a starting point, yeah. yeah. So if you import uh, our library here, as you can yeah. see here on the screen, all, all the different you see this files. material file, yeah. this manufacturing process, which comes in. Yeah, and when you import it and go back in the control panel to the design model, then you can find this manufacturing process. Oh, this is what just yes. was and there are, I would say, a million of settings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's a long list. Yeah, it's a long list, but the most important thing is the uh, the analog uh, space to model yeah. setting, yes, which is, as you can see here, predefined as 20 mm. microns, which is a good starting point yeah. because always it shrinks always, so mostly it's a little bit too tight. Mm. Yeah, And now when you create your order in the three-shape order form, mm. that's what's shown here. So you, as always, you, you mark your, your, your tools and... Uh, 
you put a specific apartment on it, like a hybrid base yeah. or a premium. And then you come to the step with the model. Oh, so, then you select the yeah, model. so now you can select the material and also directly connect it with the ELOS manufacturing process and the offset. Oh, so yeah. it comes automatically. Yeah. It. And I think it's important to mention here that it's actually not locked to the specific. So you can say this material file is, is, is a service. So using this will give you a really good first result, but you can also use your own material file. Yes, it's based on our experience with different yeah. printers to mm. set up this standard predefined offset of 20 microns, yeah. which should be good for you, but yeah. maybe also you have to adjust it a little bit, bit to your uh, yeah. process. Yeah. And this is also possible in 3 Yeah. So um, if we go to the next, yeah sheet we can see if you go okay so now one builder yeah, yeah okay application so you can always modify the setting inside your model building process okay so while you're doing it so if yes you didn't select the right material file right so you can do it here okay so maybe you you select the the, the elos material file with mm. 20 migrant but later in the printing you see oh it's a, still a little bit too mm. tight Yes, so you can easily adjust it here by clicking on the setting button on the mm -hmm. right and going down and you see over there also here there's the analog to model space setting okay, which so you, you can influence. So you can easily create your own offset during the design process in the software. Okay, interesting. And now we got a model. Yeah, now we got yeah. a model. Now you see the, the ready-made model. Yeah. And we have soft tissue and anything. And I think you, you, your next tip is about, well, well, what about this soft tissue and how does that actually work? Yes, it's more to show uh, how the analog, the placeholder file, you know, now it's really important for the fitting of the mm. PMA. So how is it protected? Yeah. Especially if you have uh, these um, gingiva uh, uh, model, yeah. So if you are select the region for the gingiva design, yeah, and probably you go below the implant shoulder visit, yes. Yeah. But the placeholder should be still protected. Yeah, it's important to mention that the the entire design of the cavity or the placeholder file yeah. is essential for the analog to work properly. Yes, yeah, and you see it here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Even if it's deeper than the shoulder of the implant. It has like analog. A it's, still, yeah. it's like a cylinder, right? Yeah, yeah. it's still protected in your software. Right. This is very important. Absolutely. It, I think in former versions it wasn't protected. No, you no, have to no, activate no. something or whatever. Yeah. 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 But so, this is true. Yeah. And I just want to show you. You see, this is a gingerbread, which from the bottom is more round. Yeah. Round shaped. Yes. But you can also do a flat shape. I know every, a lot of technicians like to have a flat gingerbread mask mm. uh, on the bottom and that's how you can do it here so you can go back uh, to the model alignment feature and then you can select the flat uh, gingerbread mask here. Oh, okay and then when you create this mask it's yeah maybe a little bit different uh, like the process before um, so you're but you end up with a with a completely flat into a mask. And is, is that for printing purposes or, or why would you choose this? Yeah, I think for me it's not so important to have this feature, but um probably it comes maybe from the behavior that you are thinking if you have a flat gingerbread mask design, you can put it directly on the printing platform because yeah. it's also flat. So you don't get any yeah. support pins and all that. Yes, but I don't I don't prefer that because the first layers when when 3D printing, the first layers are not so precise. Uh, right? Yeah. So that means if you're going directly with the flat side on your printing platform, then you have not this preci precision in your oh, Geneva mess. So I I always recommend to to print it upside down. Ah, okay. Yes, for sure. Then you have to connect this, but they are easily to cut. Yeah, but you have a very precise surface which just comes in touch with the model. Okay, yeah. so then it fits. Okay, and here we saw in, in Exocad how with the flat gingiva mask, you also get this 
protection cylinder around the analog yeah. to ensure that it's actually installed correctly. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Because I think actually in this one, I just, just saw that you actually see well, what happens if you don't have the cylinder. Yes, right. So uh, you can see here in this case, um, when you create the, the gingiver mask, so you see you have different options here yeah. inside a model builder process. Um, I think you know it if you use it each day. Yeah. Um, and if you go, go into the um, gingiver creation, so let's see here, yeah. So now it comes to the interesting part. Yeah, oh, you see there's the gingerbread design. Yeah. Yes. And if you look at it, uh yeah, looks nice. Yes, you can you can change. Um yes, the, the, it's like three control levels. Yes, you can uh cut your gingerbread profile from the model from the model. And then what happens here? So if you fade out hmm, the, the gingerbread mask. Like this, you oh, see, yeah, we don't it's have not similar. protected. No, and in this case, actually, what you would end up with would be a wobbly yes. analog because yes. this, right now it's not being centered. And you see here now on the left side, oh, yes, yeah, so the box, right. specific uh, checkbox yes, for the protection of the mm -hmm. analog. And that's what you have to activate. Yeah. Yes, And then if you go back, oh, then you so see. Now, no. now we have cylinder and we have all the right. features. Uh, that's actually yeah. required to to have it installed. Right. Okay, so this is a really this is a really important step. So always activate this checkbox yeah. if using sure. a, a, a gingerbread mask together with the PMA model. Yeah, great. So Ralph, uh, what's what's the next trick you have for us? Yeah, it's the same feature we presented in the first webinar, but now more related um, to the model creator process. And ah, yeah, it was, this uh, is called the switch to implant connection. So right. yes, and you. You sometimes in the lab you don't cannot influence what kind of scan body the hand is using to scan and send it to you. So probably you get a scan with a different scan body, mm -hmm. uh, which you are not familiar with, but you want to use the ELOS PMA because you have better results in your printing process or whatever. Yes. And now in this uh, Exocat software, you have the possibility to switch the implant connection. That means starting with a different scan body, but switching to the ELOS analog. Yes. So in the expert mode, you can use that feature and going back to the wizard, you can create a model with the ELOS PMA. Even you start oh, with a different okay. scan body. Yeah. yeah. So you That's can combine complex. different libraries together in your process, which makes sense sometimes, yes, because probably the, the provider of the scan body has no own uh, PMA feature in his library, and then you are running in it into a dead end. Yeah, for sure. In the lab. Yeah. Right. So, and you see here, now, this is the ELOS PMA placeholder connected with a different scan body. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, yeah, you can put two libraries together to one. Okay. In this case, yeah. Okay, that gives you a lot of flexibility. Right. Okay. Well, for the last trick, uh, is actually we have some giveaways. Yeah, we, we talked a lot of uh, the different process of shrinking factors, yeah. different light sources, everything like that. And we talked also how can we influence the offset and switch shape or execute software. Mm -hmm. Yes. And for sure, we have these printing guides and everything. But maybe you want to test or set up your own test process. Oh, yes. yeah. And therefore, I thought it could be nice not to start with the designing process and 3Shape or ExoCAD, but having some SDL files, which enables you to print directly with different offsets. Yeah, uh, for your different printers, for your different materials and all that. So we have a collection of, of small, actually, it's just cubes with this placeholder file in it that have a variation of different sizes. So basically, it's just to print it and then do a, a trial uh, where you see, well, where do we actually gain the best result in yes. the setup? Yes, and it uh, it starts with minus 10 micron mm -hmm. up to plus 50 micron. Yes. yes. And because these are very small cubes, you can easily set up in one building process on one platform. Yeah. You don't have to create six or five different models with different offsets and printing each. Okay. Um, you just use that cubes. And then you can 
predefine your best offset. Yeah. And you see they are marked outside. And uh, so you can use that offset following the tips and tricks section okay. to yeah to to predefine or to modify your your offset. Yeah, it makes it makes really good sense. And and going back to the printing guides, on the on the flip side of the printing guide, there is like a generic instruction on how to actually put in this value. So yes, following also your tips and tricks, uh, how to do it in three shape and exacap. Here is displayed a instruction on how to do that. Right. Perfect. I think that's this makes it it's really like nice. a digital giveaway. It's, it's a digital giveaway. giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This will give away uh, to download and, and use uh, for, for own self-testing uh, right. Great. 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 Perfect. Well, Ralph, I actually think that this concludes our, our second webinar uh, on the EDOS Accurate Analog for Printed Models. I yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And thank you very much uh, to participate with our webinar today. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, thank you for joining and I hope to see you next time. Well, they're great guys. It's kind of like um, the, the Ernie and Bird of the ELOS uh, MedTech group. They were talking about accuracy of printed models. You know, they have these predefined offsets that they work on. Uh, we print with Envision One. We also sell the Envision One printers in the whole line, Desktop Health or Envision Tech printers. Um, this is the one that we print most of our models on. We have quite a few of them. What we do to calibrate our printer, and I believe almost all the other printers should have these calibration print and L block. And then we measure and length of the L blocks width, and then we program that into our printer. And that will give us our, our most success continue of the printing. If you don't have some way to do the L block, using GOM and SPEC is the best way to go. This is what we use in the lab. You can download it and, and, and use it also. And Derek's going to go right through the steps from start to finish. Today, I'll be comparing two pieces of scan data against each other to look for anomalies, drift, or changes between one data point and the other. Uh, we'll be using a tool called GOM Inspect, which can synchronize and align and overlay multiple meshes and then produce a confidence map of their um, uh, dimensions. And this lets us see if there are changes between these meshes, uh, if parts of them are distorted or if items are missing or taller or smaller than each other and so forth. We'll be using, in this case, two data points. Um, you always need to have at least two data points and you always need to have basically a original or a known good data point to compare against. GOM inspect is a process by which you're not really comparing um, two things against each other. You're comparing one data point which you're not sure of against another which you are. Um, you can take this kind of comparison theory in a few ways, but ultimately you need to be comparing something that is uh, good or perfect or known to be better than the other data point um, or assumed to be. Um, uh, we'll be comparing these two data points. This is the original scan data, meaning scan data that came off of a scanner. Um, it could be intraoral scan, it could be a scan of a stone model or a scan of a impression. And then we'll be comparing the original scan data against this second piece of data, which is a scan of a 3D printed model that was based on this original scan data. So in this example, this data point is known good or is assumed to be the kind of superior or perfect piece of data. And then the scan of the printed model is something which could be perfect, but it could also vary based on the printer quality or calibration or what have you. So this is a pretty typical uh, example. So we're going to create a new project. And then we're going to drag the first data point into our project. We're going to call it a CAD body, which is kind of what the original data is identified as in GOM. We'll let that data point show up. Then we're going to drag the scan of the printed model into the scene. We're going to call that a mesh, and we're going to hit OK. And so in this situation, we've got the blue uh, CAD body 
data point and GOM inspect. And this is the original scan data that came out of the mouth or came off a stone model, for example. And then our gray data point is a scan of a printed model. And in this case, these implants uh, scan markers are, are missing from the scan data, but it doesn't really matter. In this situation, we're going to be comparing the model overall against uh, the other uh, mesh to kind of get a, a good sort of general comparison. Whenever you bring data into um, an inspection tool, you need to align them first. So we're going to do a pre-alignment. We're going to go up to this plus and pre-alignment. And pre-alignment looks at the geometry of both um, meshes and it sees how similar they are and it tries to align them based on how they're shaped. Um, it'll usually do this automatically as it just did. Um, in this case, we can hit OK and we can finish pre-alignment. If it ever doesn't work, if it doesn't align these two, you basically click on the original data in a known point, let's say on this incisal edge, and then you click on the same point and the other data point, and it's going to uh, align them, or at least pre-align them, meaning it's aligning them in a rough manner. We'll hit OK. Then you want to further align them. And the reason there's two alignment processes here the pre-alignment aligns them in a generic way, in a, you could say, an average way based on their um, geometry. We have to align them more specifically to get a good comparison. Um, we need their meshes to be much closer together and more accurately aligned. And the reason it's done as a second uh, step is because you do it sort of manually based on a fixed point. Now, you do this by selecting a section of data and then aligning the two based on that selection. The reason you do this is if you were trying to compare the whole model against the whole model, meaning the entire arch, I want the entire arch kind of comparison, you'd want to align it basically as it is now, but we can get a bit more specific. Um, that would give you a good alignment and that would give you a good comparison if you're looking for things like distortion or if the scale is wrong, some, some sort of big issue like that. Um, what you can also do is you can align it based on a specific point. So if you were more concerned about, let's say, one tooth or a couple teeth or, or some sort of drift or upward motion of one posterior tooth, you'd want to align it based on a more specific region. So for example, you could align it based on this posterior section only, and then you'd be kind of focusing on a more um, sort of uh, focused section, a more specific section of the skin. Um, in this case, we're going to do sort of a global one but I'll show you how that looks. So we first make our selection. And usually what I do is I look at it sort of horizontally so that I'm not selecting things that aren't interesting. I don't want to select the palette or anything like this. I just want to select meaningful mesh. So for example, this whole anterior section here. So we're going to select through surface by right-clicking and choosing that tool. Then you draw a, a box around your point of interest, and then you right click to finish it. And you'll see that we've selected this kind of all the occlusion of this kind of anterior and into the posterior here. So we're selecting a, a, a common area between these two arches that encompasses quite a bit of the data. Then we'll go back up to the plus local best fit, meaning based on the selection we just made, get more specific based on that selection, we'll hit OK. And now it's more specifically aligned. You could say it's kind of pulled in tighter or more, more tightly aligned based on that selection we made. Not much has changed in this example because of the selection we made is very large. Um, but what we're looking for is things like this, this kind of um, leopard print or, or, or checkerboarding um, across the model. And if you look at sort of evenly distributed, these kind of little um, spots. And what that shows is the two materials kind of fighting for um, dominance. What This is always a good sign. When you see things sort of speckled like this, this is called Z fighting or checkerboarding. And what that is is the two surfaces being so similar to each other and sort of competing for who is in front of the other. And it creates this nice kind of even speckled pattern. And that's a good thing. That means the two are already... Um, just at a glance, it means they're going to be very similar to each other, which is good.
you know, if you're looking for accuracy and things, you, you, you want these things to be well aligned. So now that we've got them aligned, we want to bring up a visual comparison. So we're going to go up to um, this tool over here, and you can do a surface comparison on the CAD, the CAD uh, entry, which was our original data, or a surface comparison on actual, which is our second data point, or both. You can do one and then the other. And the reason you're able to do that is, again, the idea is what direction is the comparison going in, meaning if this is known to be the good data point, you want the surface comparison on that. If this is known to be the good data point, you want it on that. So you want to kind of make your judgment based on what you feel is the, let's call it original data or the known good data. So we'll do it on CAD. It's finished, we hit okay. And then what happens here is now you want to start actually hiding items from view because you have too many things showing up now and it's going to be visually kind of messy. So we go over to our, um, our elements over here. We can expand everything. And what you're looking at here is you have your original scan data. That's the first thing we dropped in and we can hide it. You have your mesh and that's the second thing we dropped in and we can hide it. And now all that's left over is our surface comparison, which is what we see now. So we're not seeing the original data or the mesh data that we dropped in. We're just seeing the visual comparison. And you'll see that um, it's all green, which of course means they're, they're very similar, but we'll get into a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, for an example of something that's drastically different, we already see because these um, implant scan markers were missing, they weren't there in the second data point, their colors are pretty extreme. And it's because it's, just, it's saying these are so different from the original scan data that their colors are, are kind of becoming extreme there. If we look visually here, we can see some blue dots. This is showing us, based on our scale over on the right, that these blue dots represent some kind of comparative low points or holes or divots um, in the second piece of data compared with the first. And this is pretty typical in things like um, sort of rugae and features like this, especially um, when the scan data and the printed model aren't kind of... Um, it's when that's not their focus, basically. Okay, so I'm going to show you over here. So now that our, our model is all green, it means it's very similar, but it's similar based on this scale. This color scale on the right is what determines um, the similarity or the sort of scale of similarity or the tolerance, you could say. Um, it's based on millimeters. Currently, it's a scale from 5.37 millimeters above the midpoint and then minus 5.74 millimeters. So we can make this a bit more specific. We click once into it. We can change it to say two millimeters, for example, and then always want to hit this little link button and that's going to make the other number the same as this number here. We'll link it, click away, and it changes our scale. So now it's the midpoint is zero millimeters and then it scales up to dark red, which is two millimeters higher than expected. And it scales down to dark blue, which is two millimeters lower than expected. And still, even with that change of scale, which is a lot tighter tolerance, we've got green, 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 green. We've got a little bit of yellow over here. And this is actually to be expected, which is interesting. This, this model had a, uh, had a depression at this site and then it had tissue put into it. And so there is a difference between the two. I'm gonna hide our comparison, bring up the scan and you can see there's sort of a, a soft tissue section that's been placed on this printed model and we can see it there um, and it's a little bit higher than the original scan this is the original scan that's the scan of the printed model and you can see there's kind of a puffed out section where this soft tissue was and that's reflected in our comparison by this kind of yellow uh, light green yellowish patch here that's forming which is showing us that it's slightly above the original scan data um, which is good that's a that's a to be expected thing in the fringes of our comparison here you'll have other colors some blue some yellow but once once you get these other colors here this isn't really meaningful data because these are where the um, 
where the points where the data points are so drastically different because they're kind of missing sections. They weren't they were cut off or trimmed up to that point. The model, of course, will differ greatly down underneath the tissue because then you're getting into the model structure, uh, flat walls, text, et cetera, things that aren't in the original scan of the mouth, of course. If we go over to the scale, we can make it more extreme. If you're if you want to start exaggerating differences, we can make it something like one millimeter. And you'll see that patch turns more darker yellow. We can make it, for example, 0 0.5, and it turns a dark yellow, et cetera. But the idea is the differences never change. The numbers remain the same. The scale is simply changing to visualize our data in a different way or a more exaggerated way. Now, we can also bring up numbers, measurements, measurement points. We'll go to point-wise inspection, deviation labels. And then we basically, as this little instruction is going to tell you, you hold control and you can place little flags at certain points that you're trying to indicate across your scan data. So we can just kind of place these markers here. There's a little low point there, a little high point here. These are all just minuscule differences, though, of course, they're not indicating much in terms of um, this particular comparison. Once they're placed, they stick to the model. And I'll just demonstrate again this visual change over here. We'll change it back to one millimeter scale. These numbers will never change because the, the differences, the measurements of differences aren't changing. It's just our visualization that's changing. I'm just going to make this one millimeter. There's one more useful tool, which is if you're trying to find sort of a teaching tool or, or a demonstration tool that sort of globally talks about the comparison, we can go over to our, our um, uh, view menu over here. We're going to go to legend and we're going to go to show histogram. And it's going to bring up this extra little uh, section, this little graph here beside our scale. And what this is showing is the distribution of data that exists at certain points of measurement. So the, what this is showing us is our whole comparison here exists mostly in the 0%, sort of zero change, meaning perfect example of the scale. And then there's a drop off, meaning some of the data is an outlier above or below the expected measurement. So there's a little bit of data over here because it's slightly above what it expected. There's a little bit of data over here because it's slightly below what it expected. But the majority of the data exists in this kind of um, zero millimeters perfect section of the scale, let's call it. If you were to bring in two arches, for example, that were um, grossly distorted compared against each other or there are, you know, distortion or scaling issues or something, this histogram could look something more like a big line that encompasses the whole graph because the data is all over the place. In this case, because we've got a very um, accurate comparison, these two, these two data points are very similar to each other. We have a nice distribution that exists mostly in the uh, zero millimeter area. And of course, as we change our scale as before, that histogram is going to move its way outward. So if I change it to half a millimeter, the lines will move outward a bit. But it's, again, just growing with the scale. Nothing's actually changing based on the comparison. It's just the way that we're visualizing our data is becoming more exaggerated. Um, once you've kind of set up your inspection in a way that shows what you're trying to get across or shows your conclusions, you can have, for example, your scale, your histogram, your comparison points, your mesh is hidden so that all you're seeing is your comparison to be nice and clear. You can zoom in and out with the wheel, frame it nicely, and you can take a screenshot using the snipping tool in Windows or what have you. And this is, you know, something that's useful to uh, send to people for education purposes and demonstration. Thank you. Thanks to Derek for uh, doing that. Thank you to everybody for uh, joining us for this webinar. We're going to have another one in November uh, on ELOS. It'll be the part three. It'll be on hybrid bases and also CAM software. And I think there'll be quite a bit to talk about. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. And have a great day and enjoy your weekend and all the best. So take care. Signing off. Bye now.